So this is part two of why do we need buildings and organized religion to have church. So in the first one, I talked more about the buildings. And in a nutshell, uh, basically, we don't need buildings, but they're useful in the ministry. I think they're a help and not a hindrance. Uh, I know some people get hung up on the early buildings uh, were donated to the church. There were former uh, pagan temples that the church converted into uh, churches and consecrated them to God. But I see that no difference than uh, my evangelical brothers. I, I've known some that have converted bars and strip clubs and dedicated that to God. Uh, one of my favorite preachers of all time, David Wilkerson, bought a warehouse in Times Square years ago when Times Square was a cesspool and the warehouse was run down. You know, it was a crack house. Prostitution was out of there. He bought the warehouse, consecrated to God, and Times Square Church is flourishing. And amazingly, uh, I believe this man had a true gift of prophecy, and he felt like the Lord was showing him this and, uh, you know, to buy this. And then shortly after that, uh, Rudy Giuliani, whether you love him or not, cleaned up New York City and Times Square got so nice that Disney uh, went in and bought a bunch of, uh, of the blocks, and it's actually a family-friendly place. When Back when I was a kid, you would not want to bring a child in Times Square. It was, a, it was horrible. But long story short, he used that Times Square building, that church, for the glory of God, and uh, converted many prostitutes, pimps, and crack addicts that lived in that old abandoned warehouse. And in fact, if you uh, want to hear some good worship music, uh, I would recommend getting some Times Square uh, worship uh, music. And their whole choir is made up of former prostitutes, pimps, drug dealers, drug addicts, you know, the dreads of society. But God changes people, you know. There is hope in Christ, and he proves it. But anyway, so enough of that. But why do we need organized religion? Why do we need a church? Uh, you know, where people are the church. And in a spiritual sense, we are. We're the body of Christ. Christ being the head. We're the body. And, you know, for 30 years in evangelical, I was like, you know, we don't need, we don't need organized religion. We don't need an organized church. We can just kind of, you know, read the scriptures for ourselves, decide what is true, and just uh, in a spiritual way be brothers and sisters. Until I discovered in the Bible that Jesus commanded us to have a church. Jesus gave us a church. And throughout the New Testament, there's so many scriptures. If I read them all, this would be a five-hour video. So I'm going to do you a favor and just put it in the comments. I might read one or two verses uh, that I really think are appropriate for this video. But most of the verses, I'm just going to tell you what they say. And I'm going to put it in the uh, comment section. But first off... You know, and I've said this numerous times in my other videos, so I don't want to, uh, you know, for my subscribers, I don't want to keep rehashing it, but I think it's important for someone watching this the first time. Jesus told Peter, you are the rock. I'm going to build my church upon you. The gates of hell will not prevail ever. The gates of hell will not prevail. I'll be with you to the ends of the earth. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom, which signified authority. Um, he uh, told the disciples... Uh, what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Also showed that they had authority to uh, make rules. Um, he told the, uh, he breathed on the apostles and said, whoever sins you forgive are forgiven. Whoever sins you retain are retained. Giving the church the authority to forgive sins. I mean, he gave the church awesome authority. And when he spoke about the church, he didn't say church is. He said church. And Jesus' last prayer before he went to the crucifixion was, Father, let them be one as we are one. So Jesus wanted his church to be in unity. So it's another reason why there's one church. And, um, you know, a lot of Protestants will quote um, Cardinal Newman, who said to be deep in church history is to cease to be Protestant. And so, and the reason he said that, because a lot of Christians will read the first, second, third, fourth century uh, writings of the Christians that knew the people who knew the people that knew the apostles and see that the doctrine hasn't changed from then until now in the Catholic Church. But within Protestantism, it's changed. But I would add to that, and I'm going to coin a phrase today, to be deep in Scripture 
is to cease to be Protestant as well. Because that's how I made my way back to the Catholic Church, studying the scriptures. And looking to see what the early church believed, I was like, wow, it is in the scripture. So I studied both the early church, and uh, I'm going to speak a little bit about them. And you were like, well, I don't care about the early church. I'm Bible alone. I only care about the Bible. But you have to realize the early church didn't have a Bible. So if you want to get back to the first century um, Christians, I mean, St. Peter, after Pentecost, when he started preaching to the nations, and, and like, I don't know, 3,000 people got saved that day, I believe the scripture says in Acts. He was quoting from the Old Testament. They had an Old Testament, but the New Testament wasn't written yet. So the apostles turned the world upside down and saved the world without a New Testament Bible. And what he did, he preached the Old Testament and showed the Jews in the Old Testament Jesus. And St. Stephen, when he was martyred, he preached the Old Testament showing that Jesus was the Christ that the Old Testament prophesied about. And you see that throughout the Old, New Testament, how they used the Old Testament to preach. And this early church, um, this early church was called Catholic. And you're like, I don't see Catholic in the Bible. In, in the book of Acts, it says in Antioch, they were first called Christians. So they just call themselves Christians. Yeah, Catholic Christians. So also in the book of Acts, you'll see that Jesus had a bunch of little kids run him and he put one up on, on his lap and he said, you want to, you know, come to the kingdom of heaven? Be like a little child. Don't forbid the little children. Well, history tells us that little child he put on his lap was a little boy named Ignatius from Antioch. And he grew up to be Saint Ignatius. You see, after Peter left Antioch, Peter established a church in Antioch and went off to Rome. He ordained a man named Evodius to be bishop, and then Evodius ordained St. Ignatius to be bishop of Antioch. So in 107 AD, this little boy, Ignatius, who grew up to be St. Ignatius and martyred for Christ, in 107 AD, he said, where Christ is, there is the Catholic Church. And J.N.D. Kelly, a Protestant historian, commenting on this said, that term must have been commonly used for him to say it so nonchalantly like everybody knew what he was talking about. And again, he was saying that as Bishop of Antioch, the first place they were called Christians. So he was saying the Catholic Church, the universal church of Christians. And that separated us from the heresies of people saying that Jesus was one of many gods, or Jesus wasn't a god, or Jesus didn't come physically, he just came spiritually, or Jesus didn't come spiritually, just physically. So that separated the true Christians from the heretical cultic Christians. So that term Catholic Church has always been. And um, St. Irenaeus, in about, uh, about a century and a half after the apostles, um, seeing it was so important that we, and I believe Irenaeus was taught by Ignatius, if I'm not mistaken, could be, could be someone in between them, but he thought it was so important to show the unbroken line of the bishops of Rome. And if you're evangelical and you're not familiar with that term, Bishop of Rome is the same term we use for our Pope. It later grew into calling him Papa, and which translated into Pope. And so he gives the first, all the, all the bishops up into him. I don't know how many there are. I can probably only remember the first six. So he lists Peter, then Linus, who's also mentioned in the Bible, uh, Cletus, Clement, who I believe might be mentioned in the Bible as a little kid. I'm not positive about that. Uh, then after Clement, I believe it was Avest, Avorstus, and then Sixtus was the sixth. I remember that was an easy one to remember. And he went on up until his time. And now you can look back at history. You go to Wikipedia and look up the list of popes, and we can go from Pope Francis all the way back. It's like 250 or something like that. So we have an unbroken chain. And why is that so important? Because the Bible talks about passing on the traditions that I've let, said to you, like St. Paul tells Timothy and Titus, pass on these traditions that I've taught you. What you heard from me, pass on to other men. And, and so St. Timothy and Titus were ordaining other men. And that's how you knew they had the authority of St. Peter that Christ gave the church. It's an unbroken line. It's called apostolic succession. And they were passing on 
apostolic tradition, not traditions of men that Jesus condemned, but traditions of the apostles that they learned from Jesus. Again, we did not have, at this time I'm talking about the early church, we did not have a, a canon of the New Testament where the church said, okay, these books belong in there. It wasn't until the Catholic Church in the um, fourth century had councils to decide which book should be in the New Testament and guided by the Holy Spirit. And an example of a council would be the first council of Jerusalem in Acts 15, where the apostles had to make a decision. They didn't study the scriptures to come up with it. They asked the Holy Spirit to show them. And then they debated and they came up with a decision. That's how the church has been doing it since the book of Acts. So many councils. So at the Council of Rome in 382, they said these New Testament books should be these books, these books should be in the New Testament. And then at the Council of Hippo in 393, and the Council of Cartridge in 397, the same books, they agreed. So they didn't just, someone just to say, oh, this should be like, like Joseph Smith, this is the Book of Mormon, boom, and just makes up a book. They spent decades studying scriptures that were passed down from the apostles and the apostles' successors, you know, three, 300 and some odd years. And they said, okay, based on apostolic tradition or sacred tradition these are the books that the church has always considered inspired by god god breathed so these are the books that will be in the new testament and my protestant brothers out there they're the same books that you read every day so if you love your bible you should love the catholic church because they gave us the bible um and then another quick point i just want to make is it's important that we have an organized church because God is a God of order. He doesn't want people just coming up with their own uh, revelation and starting a new church. And, and, I, and if you don't believe me, I'm going to read that. I'm going to read in the scripture. So if you want, like I said, you can look at all these later. And I encourage you to look at all the scriptures I put down. I'll put them in the com these as well in the comment. Be like the Bereans and search to see what I'm telling you is true. So, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. First of all, you must understand this, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, because no prophecy, prophecy ever came by the impulse of man, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. So, the Scriptures are coming from God, so you can't just interpret them on your own. These are infallible words of God, the Holy Scriptures. So you need an infallible church. And that's a bold claim that the Catholic Church has made. But none of their doctrines for 2,000 years has ever changed. So they, their doctrines have stood. The doctrine of the Trinity, the divinity of Christ, the virgin birth. These doctrines have stood for 2,000 years of the church. Uh, so they back up their claim that they, the church, speaking on matters of faith... And morals is inspired by God. So the infallible church interprets the scriptures, and that's how we stay safe. If not, you have a young man like Joseph Smith when he's a teenager saying, no, every church is wrong. Since the apostles died, everybody's been wrong. 14-year-old Joseph Smith is going to make a new book, and it's going to be equal and even better than the Bible. Joseph Smith's going to tell us that Jesus was just one of many God. He wasn't God Almighty, the one and only true God that Christians have proclaimed for 2,000 years. And you say, okay, well, you know, it's obvious that's a cult. You're obvious that's, that's ridiculous. Well, even, even like good uh, Protestant pastors have gone off the rails. One of my favorite Christian artists, a guy named Carmen, uh, he's a singer. He actually sang a song with one of his pastors. He was a really solid, you know, non-denominational, charismatic pastor. And he came out a few years ago and says, I believe God has revealed to me uh, through the scriptures, my own interpretation, hell doesn't exist. That's a heresy. For 2,000 years, the church has taught hell exists. Jesus talked more about hell than heaven. So we know hell exists. But that was his own interpretation. Now, I'm not saying Christians can't read their Bible. The Catholic Church encourages all Catholics to read their Bible. And sometimes God will give you a private revelation. Private. He may say, he may say to you, you know, he wants you to do this through the scriptures. He wants you, you know, to repent of a certain sin or, or, you know, he might speak to your heart and convict you about not loving your neighbor as yourself. God does speak through us. The, the word is living. It's alive. It's a two-edged sword. It pierces deep. I'm not saying that. I'm saying public revelation. All public revelation is finished. 
And most Protestants, Baptists, uh, Assemblies of God, Presbyterian, they will agree with this statement. The canon is settled. You can't make a new Bible like Joseph Smith did. The canon is settled. You can't come out with no new doctrine. It's settled. But it doesn't say that in the Bible. So if you're Bible alone, you're trusting the Catholic Church. When they said, when they closed the canon at those councils I told you about in the 4th century, the canon is closed. Pro public revelation is finished. You're trusting the Catholic Church. And you should be thankful for your Catholic Church. Because they gave you a lot of the, all of the doctrines you believe today if you're, you know, a mainline Protestant. Um, and if, if you still don't believe that it's dangerous for people not to have the church guide in the scriptures, and you, you say, well, maybe, you know, that was a little vague, what Peter said. Maybe I'm misinterpreting that with my own interpretation. Well, he makes it clear the next chapter over, chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. Same book. Same apostle, St. Peter. Speaking of this, as he does in all his letters. Okay, so I'm sorry. Let me back it up to 15. And count the forbearance of our Lord as salvation. So also our beloved brother Paul wrote to you according to the wisdom given him. Speaking of this, as he does in all his letters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do other scriptures. Second Peter 3, 15, and 16, St. Peter is saying that there's Christians that are twisting the scriptures because they're interpreting it on their own without the church's guidance. So this is why we need an organized religion. Jesus Christ alone is God. He saves us. But the early church fathers that I spoke about and the Catholic Church see salvation like this. When we're baptized, we're baptized into the family of God, into the church. And Christ saves us through the church like God saved Noah's family through the ark, with the ark. And in fact, St. Peter says that uh, in his letters, and you can look this up, I'll put this in the comments. He, he explains how Noah was saved through the, with the ark, now... Baptism saves us. That's a, that's a quote from St. Peter. That's what the Bible says. Now baptism saves us. So just like in the Old Testament, they were saved by circumcision. And through the ark, you know, circumcision, they were born into the family of God. The New Testament, baptism, were born into the family of God. Whereas, and we see the importance of the family of God, the body of Christ. Jesus being the head, the church being his body. We're born into that body. It's a family affair. Where when I was an evangelical for years, I seen it more as me, me, me. It's just my personal relationship with God. And it's a good idea for me to join or to fellowship and to kind of like a social club, which we call the church. Where the Catholic Church looks at it as a leave, living, breathing, spiritual entity with an organized head, with an organization. And if you still don't believe it, think about this verse I'm sure you're familiar with. Where Jesus said, if someone sins against you, go to him and... And tell him, hey, you sinned. You need to repent. But if he still doesn't repent, bring a witness and say, come on, man. You're, you need to repent. If the brother still doesn't repent, it says bring him to the church. It doesn't say bring him to churches or pick a church. It says bring him to the church because Jesus only established one church. So how would that work if there was 30,000 denominations like there is today in Jesus' time? The apostle, you would bring him to what church? You bring him to a Southern Baptist church? Um, and then he, he, he doesn't like the discipline he gets, so he goes to the Presbyterian church. And he doesn't like the discipline he gets there. So he goes to a uh, Episcopalian church and they let anything go in that church. <laughs> uh, so you see how God gave us a church to protect us and to keep us on our walk. We have to persevere to the end. We have to walk the walk. We've got to fight the fight. We've got to run the race. And the church is a gift from God to guide us. So, in the same way, he inspired the church, the apostles that were part of the church, to write letters, even though they weren't perfect men, he inspires the church to interpret the letters, even though they're not perfect men. And it's not me saying this. Jesus said, the gates of hell will not prevail against you, speaking of his church. And he says, the church, the Bible says the church is the pillar of truth. The church is the pillar of truth. So if you want truth, where do you go? To the church. What church? The church that Jesus established based on historic, 
historical evidence. The one church we have, even if you look up Wikipedia, Catholic Church, who's the founder? It says Jesus Christ. <laughs> you know, you look up uh, Presbyterian Church, who's the founder? John Knox. Baptist Church, who's the founder? John Smith. Lutheran Church, who's the founder? Martin Luther. Mormon Church, who's the founder? Joseph Smith. Again, go to Wikipedia, who's the founder of the Catholic Church? Jesus Christ. So that's why we need organized religion and churches, church buildings are a blessing. We don't need them in the Amazon. I don't think they have many buildings. I think they meet in the jungle. And, but where the bishop is, where Christ is, there's the Catholic Church, according to St. Ignatius, who sat on Jesus' lap. So God bless. I hope this was helpful. Sorry it went so long.